it's going to be tough on this with this tune. Jai Radha Madhava Punjabi Hari Gopi Jana Balava Giri Vardhari Jasodhananana Vajra Jana Ramjana Jamuna Tiravana Chari Jai Radha Madhava Kunjabi Hari Gopi Jana Balava Giri Vardhari Jasodhananana Vajra Jana Ramjana Jamuna Tiravana Chari Jai Radha Madhava Kunjabi Hari Gopi Jana Balava Giri Vardhari Jasodhananana Vajra Jana Ramjana Jamuna Tiravana Chari
नमो भगवती वासुदेवाय नमो भगवती वासुदेवाय नमो भगवती वासुदेवाय नरम नमस्कृत नरम चरतम दिवी सरस्वती व्यास तथो जयम उदीरएद नास्त प्रयेशुवाद्रेशु नित्यम भगवत सेवाय भगवातुतम श्लोके भक्तिर्भवती नैस्तुके सो दिस इज दि फोर्थ कैंटो सेकंड चैप्टर टेक्स्ट थर्टी दक्ष कर्सिस लोर शिव and everybody curses each other after that brahma sorry i was interrupted brahma cha brahma nam staiva yad ya yad yu yam parinni i need my glasses and i forgot them <laughs> thank you Oh yeah I can see now Yad yuyam parinindata Satum vidaranam pumsam Atapashand mashrita Brahma cha brahmanam staiva Yad yuyam parinindata सुम विदारण पुंसम अतापंदमाश्रित ब्रह्म च भ्रमण यादुज परनिंदता सुम विदारण पुंसम अतापंदमाश्रित ब्रह्मचाब्रमनमश्चाब्रमनमश्चाब यायुयां परिनिंदता सुतुं विदरनाम पुंसम अतापस्चन्नमाश्रिता रामचाब्रमनमस्चाइवा परिनिंदता Anyone else? No, 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 Brahma, the Vedas, Cha, and Ramanam, the Brahmanas, Cha, and Eva, certainly, yet, because, you, yam, you, Parnindata, blaspheme, Setum, Vedic principles. vidaranam holding holding pumsam of mankind ata therefore pasandam 
atheism. Ashrita have taken shelter. Srila Prabhupada translation and purport. Prigumuni continued. Since you blaspheme the Vedas and the Brahmanas, who are followers of the Vedic principles, it is understood that you have already taken shelter of the doctrine of atheism. Please repeat. Brigumuni continued. Since you blaspheme the Vedas and the Brahmanas, who are followers of the Vedic principles, it is understood that you have already taken shelter of the doctrine of atheism. Purport. Brigamuni, in cursing Nandishwar, said that not only would they be degraded as atheists because of this curse, but they had already fallen to the standard of atheism because they had blasphemed the Vedas, which are the source of human civilization. Human civilization is based on the qualitative divisions of social order, namely the intelligent class, the martial class, the productive class, and the liberal class. The Vedas provide the right direction for advancing in spiritual cultivation and economic development and regulating the principle of sense gratification, so that ultimately one may be liberated from material contamination to his real state of spiritual identification, aham pramasmi. As long as one is in con the contamination of material existence, one changes bodies from the aquatics up to the position of Brahma. But the human form of life is the highest perfection of life in the material world. The Vedas give directions by which to elevate oneself in the next life. The Vedas are the mother for such instructions, and the Brahmanas, or persons who are in knowledge of the Vedas, are the father. Thus, if one blasphemes the Vedas, and Brahmanas, naturally one goes down to the status of atheism. The exact word used in Sanskrit is Nastika, which refers to one who does not believe in the Vedas but manufactures some concocted system of religion. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu has said that the followers of the Buddhist system of religion are Nastikas. In order to establish his doctrine of non-violence, Lord Buddha flatly refused to believe in the Vedas. And thus, later on, Shankaracharya stopped the system of religion in India and forced it to go outside of India. Here is stated, Brahmacha Brahmanam. Brahma means the Vedas. Aham Brahmasmi means, I am in full knowledge. The Vedic assertion is that one think, what should think that he is Brahman, for actually he is Brahman. If Brahma or the Vedic spiritual science is condemned and the masters of the spiritual science, the Brahmanas, are condemned, then where does human civilization stand? Brigamuni said, it is not due to my cursing that you shall become atheist. You are already situated in a principle of atheism. Therefore, you are condemned. Om Ajnanati Mirandasya Kinanjana Shalakaya Chaksur Militam Jena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Mukam karoti vachalam pangum langati grim yatri pata maham vande shigurum de taranam paramana and the madam shichitam yanim ishwaram. So please, as is customary here, if you have any spare blessings for someone who has no knowledge of the self and very little of the body as well, I would that would be appreciated. So here it is, uh, again, another racquetball game between the, the Brahmanas, the so-called Brahmanas. Everybody's just throwing stuff at each other, you know, hoping, hoping for the best. But there's, there's no much thinking involved. And this is when people were intelligent. Like nowadays, as Prabhupada defines, the, you know, the four divisions, the intelligent class, the martial class, the productive class and the laborer class is, is pretty much all gone except for the laborers. And the laborers disguise themselves as in the intelligent class or the martial class. Like I, I've heard the body say, oh yes, the policemen are kratrias. No, they're not. They're shooters. They just got a job, you know, because of the security of it, because of a good pension. They are 
they just, they just like to scream at people. This is not the martial class. Martial class are noble kings and warriors that will sacrifice anything for the benefit of humankind. And they will actually listen to the Brahmins. So this is the, this is the difference that the martial class right now is sutras and the politicians who's supposed to be the administrative ruling class are sutras and the sutras are sutras and the Brahmins are sutras. So everybody's a sutra. And Kalo Sudra Sambhava, this is the age. This is the age where everybody, uh, people want equality. Well, they got it. They're all Sudras. So, there you go. This is, this is a gift from Kali Yuga, that everybody is equal. That no one is better than anybody else. Just, so, how, what are we gonna do with this? It's like there is, it's like if everybody is a president, there is no president. So if everybody's a Sudra, then there is no intelligent class, there is no martial class, there is simply sudras. There is a bunch of people with no idea of what they should be doing. And here, even though it didn't happen, this didn't happen in Kali Yuga, you know, it was kind of a preview of coming attractions that people will actually be degrading themselves. And what is, um, here, Brigham Muni is saying you are, you don't need to be cursed to be atheist because you already are. You're already blaspheming the Brahmins, decrying the Vedas. That's, that's a symptom of atheism. Um, atheism is a strong position because one may be an agnostic. One may have doubts about God or divine manifestation, intelligence, intelligent design. So one may have doubts, and that, that is a, a more modest position than becoming an atheist, because atheists have a big burden on their shoulders. They have to, atheist means no God. Theos is the Greek word for God. A is the opposite, like no, like negation of the following word. So ath- if I say I'm an atheist, that means I have concrete proof that there is no God. And this is, unless you know everything, you, you really couldn't know that. And if you do know everything, then you're God and you cannot be an atheist. So it's, it's a really bad position to be situated in. Uh, also, to decry the absolute truth is, is <clears throat> this actually, that's an absolute statement. There is no absolute truth. So that basically is self-contradictory. So it's very difficult to start from a dead end um, street for a long journey. Like you see, you know, this street ends here. Uh, don't put gas, don't pack up, don't, you know, don't get snacks. You're not going anywhere. This is really a very short trip. So atheists are, they have a very short journey to Yamaraja's court. And this is, due to the unfortunate uh, influence of Kali Yuga, where people are not prepared for the things that are required for self-realization. First of all, <clears throat> self-realization depends on the Brahman class. So there is no Brahman class. So where do you find self-realization? You can actually go online and you know type self-realization, or Google it. And I'm sure there will be plenty of places, you know, advertise as, you know, we will help you out. Self-help, crystals, uh, aluminum foil hats, propellers, although whatever, whatever they do for self-realization. There is self-realization means you understand who you are. And if you don't understand who God is, then you can't understand who you are because you're part and parcel of God. So it's a really poor start to, to be an atheist or to claim that you're an atheist is a, is a really difficult situation. And you may find out that you're wrong. Um, and you, you may not like what you see. Uh, you will be. Actually, you will find out that you're wrong. Sometimes, Krishna is, you know, has a plan, whereas 
a person has an epiphany and they actually realize there is more than me. Well, that's, that's a great realization. You know, I am everything. And then all of a sudden you realize, wait, maybe there is something else. So that is a, a very fortunate event where you actually realize that there are, uh, there is a God and there is a family that God is providing for maintaining and enlightening on, on occasion. So, um, there's, there's another interesting, there's several interesting points in, uh, in Prabhupada's purport here. Um, he said that the, the Vedas are the mother and the Brahmanas are the father because they know the Vedas. Like Prabhupada gave an, always the example of, you know, how do you know anything? So how do you know who your father is? He asked that to different people and they, they came out, well, well, this or that. Uh, DNA wasn't so popular at the time Prabhupada was around. So, uh, and Prabhupada gave a very simple answer, which is brilliant. He said, you ask your mother. Of course, if you ask your mother and she doesn't know, then you know, that's a problem. You know. But your mother should know, as the Beatles said. And there is a word in Sanskrit, nastika. Um, nastika is, it's not naistika. Naistika is different. Naistika means a lifetime. Uh, like, like naistika brahmachari. That's, uh, like Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur. Nastika means, actually maybe nasty comes from there. People who don't believe in the Vedas. And, um, the, the Buddhists, uh, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu actually said that the followers of Buddhism are Nastikas because they don't follow the Vedas. They, because in order to present his plan, wasn't even a philosophy, um, Lord Buddha had to decry the authority of the Vedas. So, although Bhaktisiddhanta in one of his letters said that the, the, the Buddhists are, are devotees, as long as their leader is a devotee. So they have to follow someone who is a devotee. Yeah. Then they're very close. Now you can see there are people who have come to a certain point and they need guidance past that point. It's like having a coach uh, in, a, in whatever sport you are, you know, discipline you, you do. Uh, the coach may have limited knowledge. So you can reach a certain point and you can go past that. So Buddha just gave a certain, he had a, he had a function and he had to give a certain amount of knowledge and uh, that's it. He didn't want to give anymore because people weren't prepared. He actually stopped um, animal slaughter and, and that was, that was quite something. You may say, well, what's, what's the merit? But look at, look at the states uh, where millions of animals are sacrificed every day. Imagine if someone comes and stops slaughter. That would be a, a great achievement. So we may not give Buddha perhaps the credit that he deserves, but he stopped slaughtering. He actually, because people were, uh, the, the things that, that there are, there are injunctions in the Vedas, because the Vedas are not written just for the Brahmins. You know, there are actually sections of the Vedas that are for, for Sudras. And one of the injunctions was that you could kill a goat on a moonless night while uttering the words mamsa. You know, with mamsa it means meat, but also mamsa means I'll become you. So this is, this is what you're saying while you're killing an animal. I will be you. I, I will be in the same situation that you are. So, after saying that, after repeatedly, uh, you supposed to figure out, wait, wait, there's something wrong here. Uh, uh, that means I'm going to be an animal. I'm going to be killed. Forget it. I mean, I, I don't want to do this. This is, this is wrong. So that is a concession, but in the name of a, uh, and also there, there are horse sacrifices. That were performed as Vameda Jagyas. And the Jagyas, 
the horse was kind of the uh, litmus test. It was like a, like, like a pH paper that you check the acidity of, of something, you know, just you, you prepare something and you check, see, see if it worked and you, you read the numbers. So the horse was actually the proof that the sacrifice was correct because they were very precise. All the mantras have to be pronounced correctly and all the, you know, all the yantras and tantras and mudras and sudras and everything else had to be perfect. So, if a horse came out with a new, an old horse, it wasn't done with, you know, a prize stallion that you know, was about to win the Kentucky Derby. It was, it was an old horse that was put through. And if everything went okay, a, a new horse will come through. A horse with a new body. So if it didn't come out, well, the sacrifice had some problem. And they had to do it again, and they had to. So eventually, they got so degraded that they were having barbecue horses. They were actually, you know, using it as a justification to kill and to eat, because that's that's how Kali Yuga works. And people become degraded, and then they lose their brain if they had one to begin with. They they lose it in the in the process, and they. It's hard to get it back. As you can see, when, I don't know if you have experienced this, but I've seen people lose their mind and they don't get it back. This is, it's very difficult. Someone gets into that kind of abyss where they, they are lost. They, they don't come back. Actually, I was, uh, growing up, I had two fears. I'm, I've always been pretty fearless, but I had two fears, uh, to, to go mad and to be medio a mediocre person. It's because, um, I've seen people when they, they deviate, they go, go crazy. They don't come back. They just stay crazy for the rest of their life. So this is, this is what happens. The Vedas are all of a sudden uh, a joke because people perform sacrifices for the sake of killing, eating, and so on. And then Buddha came and he had no choice. He said, forget the Vedas. And because he was an incarnation, he, he had a very good one-liner. He said, forget the Vedas, follow me. Being an incarnation of God, forget God, follow me. I'm God, by the way, but I won't tell you that. So they, they actually did the right thing. And Shankaracharya, um, later on, this was, so Buddha was about, what, 2,500 years ago, and Shankaracharya was about 800, 800 to 1,000 years ago, uh, came and reestablished the authority of the Vedas. But because people were um, not the brightest, he couldn't give a full version. So he had to present a, kind of a disguised version of the Vedas where, you know, the ultimate uh, truth is impersonal. I had a, I had an experience to, I met a devotee, but before I met the first devotee, I, I was with a guy, I can't even remember where he was from. It was many years ago. It was in Brazil, and he started to tell me about uh, Mayavadi philosophy. I never heard of it before. I I read existentialism and you know and and everything else, but I, I never heard about Mayavadi philosophy. So he told me that um, everything was nothing, and nothing was better than everything because nothing contains everything and you know very confusing stuff and it didn't make any sense to me so i i took it like whatever you know it just doesn't make sense to me and and then i met a devotee the next day that was you know i didn't alone latch on to to that mayavadi nonsense because there is no there is no point there's no point. We see that everything is personal. How, how could we justify the ultimate truth being impersonal? Everything has personality. 
I see hundreds of people. I don't know what's with Denver and, and people owning dogs. Everybody has a dog and everybody takes a dog around. And I'm sure every dog has a personality, at least to the owners, they, they do. Yeah, absolutely. It's not, it's not like any other dog. And they have feelings. And what to speak of everything else that you can see there is, there's design. If you go to a, unless you go to a college dorm, which is a, you know, a, a, like a war zone for, for aesthetics. If you go anywhere else, you will see that there is a person, there is a, there is personality behind because there is design, there is planning, there is thought, there is a lot of stuff. So look at the world that is surrounding you and tell me there is no personality, there is no intelligence, that everything happened by happenstance, by chance, just everything landed somehow or other like this. Colors and trees and fruits and vegetables and animals and and there is there's so much variety that there must be the ultimate truth must be personal because we are surrounded by personality and and the ultimate point here and the discussed in the purpur is that brahmacha brahmanam brahma means the vedas aham brahmasmi means i am in full knowledge so this is knowledge knowledge means i know who i am i'm brahman i'm not the body those words actually convinced me to become a Hare krishna devotee you're not the body that's that as soon as I heard that, I said, that's, that's it. That's, that's all I needed. I'm going to follow this path. I don't care. I don't care how long it takes and what, it, where it takes me. This is it. And finally, something made sense. You know, before that, it was very confusing. So there is, again, Brigo Muni cursing, and then Dishra cursing, cursing, and Daksha cursing, and, you know, then, then they're gonna be very happy. That's usually what happens when, when people curse. They, their heart shrinks. They become bitter. This, when they, because this, this hatred is, it's like a very temporary relief. It's like when you're, when you had a bad night because you were bitten by mosquitoes all night. And then in the morning you just wake up and just scratch yourself to, until you bleed. Uh, this is, this is not real relief. You're gonna be, you're gonna be sorry you did that. So, okay, you have some e um, ill intent against someone who uh, did you wrong. And, and then you curse them or you hate them or you wish them ill. And this is, this is just scratching yourself until you bleed, basically, basically. And you're gonna be, you're gonna be bleeding out of that one. And you're not gonna be satisfied. Yes, this is what happened. This, when you cultivate hatred and antagonism, it doesn't go anywhere. It, it just actually comes back to haunt you. Because the purpose is to make the heart softer, not to make the heart harder. And all these things make the heart shrink, makes it dry. And, and it, it is, it doesn't feel right. Yes. A dry heart is not, not a very comfortable, um, item at all. Um, I would like to open now for, for questions, realizations, and reflections, and so on. And also, I would like to add at your discretion uh, about Gopal Bhatta Goswami, whose disappearance was yesterday, and nothing was mentioned about him. So I, I did a little research, and I will say a few words. So let, first, let's talk about the the verse and the issue at the heart. Yes, Prabhu.
Thank you, Prabhu. I had a, <clears throat> a question about um, you were explaining that everyone's equal, Kalau Sudra, Sambhava. Um, my question from that is, it does. It doesn't seem like that sometimes. Like you can, like one group of people might live in like a poverty-stricken area, prone to crime and drugs and violence, and these things. And then another group lives in nice suburban areas, which are also prone to I mean, different types of crime and violence and drugs and alcohol. But um, it can look nicer and seems nicer, like you know walk down the street without getting robbed and and um so how is it that everyone's equal and and it's why isn't it obvious um to the world at large fair enough well karma is a great equalizer because eventually the, those who live in a, in a rich area in a, in a gated community that, um, they're also performing sinful activities that eventually will take them to the ghetto into, in next life. So, um, everybody's equal in the sense that everybody was born without a brain. Uh, so in, in that sense, yes, there is, there is equality. And some people, because of their pious activities, end up Having, like, like in India, for example, there's, I don't know if things are like that, but it used to be that, uh, someone who owned a mansion in India will have, um, poor people putting tarps against the outside wall and living there, you know, very poor people. But the rich person would not evict him knowing that if he did that, he will be in the same situation in his next life. And the poor people would not attempt to break in and steal from a rich person because they understand that that's why they are living in a tarp against a wall, an outer wall. So if, if that knowledge is there, then things will get better. But as far as, you know, the karma is, is a great equalizer because people, they have no idea of the Vedas. They have no idea of karma. They mention karma as if it was kind of like a, you know, fashion word, like karma, vegan, you know, all those things, they don't mean the same thing. It's something I won't do. You know, I won't study. I won't be interested in. So, yeah, I, I think everybody is equal. Everybody was provided a body without a, a brain or a, a, a totally unutilized. The brain is there, but it's not being used properly. People follow ridiculous illogical philosophies or so-called philosophies and uh, patterns of life and they have addictive personalities you know you, you explain to someone you know meat is bad for you or this preserved stuff is bad for you or this is bad for you alcohol is bad for you and and they they may understand the principle but they have they can't help themselves they are just trapped in the, in the circle that they created so everybody's equal, yeah. Everybody has equal opportunity, even though externally it may not appear that way. Um, I have, I have a couple, I have a friend who's a doctor and I tell him, you know, I try to in, inject as much philosophy as I can, but when it gets to the point of karma, they have a hard time. Especially, uh, especially if they, they actually mention children suffering from horrible diseases. That's, that's like, you know, that's the ultimate insult to, to them. They couldn't be, uh, couldn't be a god or, you know, karma, you know, couldn't be a, a good system of justice if children are suffering. But the example I give, or I gave, is, let's say there is a, there is a guy who is as crooked as you can find. And he has a whole emporium. There's a criminal enterprise and he's living based on, he's, he makes his living based on extortion, bribery, murder, 
you name it, it's all there. And this person never even has a cold and die, is, has enormous riches and lives a long life and dies in his sleep surrounded by his uh, loving relatives in the hills of Toscana in Italy, you know. So, okay, there is a picture. And then there is a, can you please not do that? Um, there is a, a child born in a refugee camp and, you know, outside of Syria somewhere, uh, with bombs flying all over the place, but it's not enough food to eat, but there is uh, crime and persecution and disease and everything else, and lives to be uh, a year old, or two years old, and dies of a, you know, malnutrition and some disease that can be easily cured in other places, etc., etc. So there is another picture. Those two pictures, they seem like, what the hell is going on? But if you put them together, that that guy that died during his sleep is born in a refugee camp, is the same person, is the same soul transmigrating to a body to suffer for the things he has done, then it totally makes sense. But people who are not very philosophical or intelligent, they can't make the association. So there is equality, you know, it's distributed according to what we deserve. So whatever happens to us, whatever happens to others, we cannot be callous and say, well, you know, I'm sorry you're suffering right now, but uh, you have to go through that, and I'm, I will make sure you do. Uh, I will not intervene. I will not help you. No, it's our duty to, to help, to elevate these people. But as far as putting band-aids on uh, gangrene, it, it doesn't help. Yes. So we, the only help that helps is trying to help people transcend. Everything else is literally useless. Is that okay? Thanks, Prabhu. So you were saying how um, everything's personal. So one time we explained to uh, some students, you know, this philosophy, it, everything's personal, and um, one devotee told the story about, you know, and the spiritual world, the houses are persons, and, and then they said, well, you know, that sounds like uh, a cartoon or Disneyland, it, you know, can't be real, it sounds really goofy. So can you say something about how to, because we didn't, somehow it didn't go over very well in that classroom so how could we explain you know it's really wonderful how everything is personal to um, you know to the students so they like really appreciate it but don't think of it as you know kind of just you know cartoon life or something That's a fair question. Well, who, who are the most exalted devotees of Lord Krishna? The gopis. Yet they are jealous of the flute, of a stick. So why would they be jealous of a stick? Because it's, it's not just a stick. It's that sentient being that is being kissed by Krishna's lips you know, every chance he has. And the gopis don't get kissed that often. So, uh, in the spiritual world, things are a little different. They don't, they're not exactly like here. I mean, we can project. Um, it's just like the story of a frog and the, uh, frog in the pond. Since someone, uh, another frog, or I can't remember the fable, uh, what animal it was, was trying to explain the ocean to the frog in the pond. And, uh, and he couldn't understand. You mean it's bigger than the pond? Oh yeah, much bigger than the pond. It's like twice as big? Uh, no, much bigger, much bigger. Uh, four times as big? No, no. The ocean is incredibly 
bigger and you know, and it, it just went on and on. You know, you, you can actually multiply as many times as you want uh, your worry to the spiritual world, and it's not going to work. Your math is never going to add up because it's it's a different realm where things don't happen based on you know the material world is a perverted reflection of the spiritual world, but it but there is even more. It's not just that. Like we are accustomed to uh, think of a spiritual world as a five acre lot. You know, what we see on the paintings, it's like, you know, ma- max five acres, uh, you know, and, and there's five acres over there and there's five acres over there. So it must be like at least 50 acres. <sighs> more? Yes, there's a lot more. It's, it's unlimited. And there are things that are inconceivable, like Krishna will go from one forest to the next, even in Gokula Vrindavan. What to speak of Goloka Vrindavan? I mean, uh, there's no problem with transportation there. But even in when Krishna appear in Gokula, he is describing a Krishna book that he will, uh, he and the cover boys were in a forest tending the cows, and then they will go to another one, and then another one. They're, they're miles and miles away. But Vrindavan is like a lotus flower, and the petals are expanded, and at night, they close. So they're next to each other. So that's how they can go from one to the next, to the next, you know, just with a simple step. So for us to try to squeeze the vast unlimitedness of the spiritual world through the mind of a student who doesn't know where a tongue scraper is. <laughs> it's kind of difficult. I will say just give them what they can absorb. What they can absorb. And if it is if you're sometimes we aim too high. We get lost in the ecstasy of listening to this sweet sound of our own voice. And we forget that the message is not being properly received. So we just have to come down to planet Earth and, and start over and give a little less and a little less. It's like a, it's like a patient coming out of surgery. You know, you can't just bring him a pizza. You know, the, the moment he came out of surgery, it just won't work. So we have to dose it somehow or other and dose, uh, even Krishna Das Kaviraj Goswami, he confessed in the Chitani Charitamrita. He said, I, I shouldn't be writing about this stuff. This is way too advanced. This is way too esoteric and intimate. I, I shouldn't be doing that. But if I don't do it, how would people know? So he took the risk. So sometimes when you're teaching Krishna consciousness to others, you have to invoke certain portions that are a little past the capacity of your audience and hope for the best. But if they don't, yeah, don't be discouraged, just go to the, you know, just lower it. Just just go to your console and turn down a couple of notches and they, they should get it. Yeah, in them, they think it's cartoonish, it's okay because um, they're going to think about it anyway, and they will get benefit. Just like we... Also, there, there's certain things that I... I don't know if they're very relevant. Like I... When I hear about, you know, Ravana having ten heads, or Lord Brahma having millions of heads, and so on, how does it, that modify or affect my devotional service? It, it doesn't matter, really. It, if Brahma has one head, four head, a million heads, how does it affect my devotional service? They can, sure, why not? You can have as many heads as you want. And it doesn't, doesn't make any difference to me. So for someone who is, doesn't understand the dynamics of the spiritual world or the structure of it, it's okay. Just try to engage them in devotional service and uh, eventually all these impurities will be ironed out. Uh, you know, the shirt will look fine. I think that 
that's the best thing. Prasadam and books and kindness, like like you do. Is that okay? Hi, Krishna Prabhu. Thank you for the nice class. Um, I was thinking about the context of the verse, uh, specifically um, it's a situation where uh, Daksha has uh, blasphemed Lord Shiva and Nandishvar is retaliating and Bhrigu is, Bhrigu Muni is retaliating in response. And usually in the material world when uh, conflicts degenerate to that level, the um, the content that is spoken is um, is quite negative, and here also the content is negative. But even though that may be the case, what Brigamuni is saying still holds relevance. That if somebody is rejecting the Vedas or is not following the Vedic tradition, that that person uh, is in a hopeless condition. Um, the Vedas are our mother. They describe what our position is. And if somebody is uh, um, rejecting or decrying that uh, source of knowledge, then the default is that that person will think that they're the body. That, that to um, satisfy the urges of the body is the ultimate goal of one's existence. And one has no conception that that they are ultimately spirit. And the reason I bring that up is, you know, I had a, an exchange with His Holiness Bhakti Churu Swami where I asked him this question. I, I asked him, what do you do if somebody doesn't believe in the Vedas? And he he told me that it's 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 a bit hopeless then if they don't accept the authority of the Vedic tradition or the Vedic knowledge. And the only thing you can do for such a person is um, give them prashad. So, you know, prashad being mercy. So, just wanted to share that. Thank you for for that. Um, I agree. Um, and I think that we should just move on to the next person who may accept the authority. So yes, there are people who are we may spend excess excessive amounts of time trying to bring them up to a certain level of understanding and uh, they don't have it. They don't have the Sukriti, they don't have, they don't have intelligence, they don't have a piety, they don't have knowledge and uh, we try and try and try and my advice is just move on. Just the, these people will have to, you know, you did what you could and that's all you can do. So yeah, there, there's so many that don't accept the authority of the Vedas. Maybe us too. Maybe there's some certain portion of the Vedas that we have a hard time digesting. But do you think there is hope for us? Uh, yeah, so, so do I. So hope, hopefully all this, you know, again, is, we are fighting against Kali and we are fighting against our senses and against Maya's curveballs. This is a big battle and we just have to get up and keep going. You can't just feel pity for yourself and stop fighting. That's not, not the way we do things. Not the way we shouldn't think, do things. If there is, there isn't anything else uh, I'd like to read about Gopal Bhatta Goswami rather quickly. Anybody else has any anything to share? Any criticism? 
No, no yellow cards today. Okay, so Gopal Bhatta Goswami was born in 1503, 13th day of dark moon, month of Pausha. He um, lived 75 years and passed away in 1578. He was the son of Vienkata Bhatta, Brahmana resident of Sri Rangam. Um, he, he was from uh, Sri Shampadaya. You know, they, they believe that Lakshmi Narayan are the, the highest truth, as opposed to Radha Krishna. Of course, Lord Chaitanya would play, play around with Gopal Bhatta when he was a kid, and, and also his father, and, and said, um, why, why did Lakshmi took so much trouble to try to attain Krishna if she was situated in the highest position. Why? And of course, this Vienkata Bhatta eventually became, you know, the Lila Gosa became a great devotee of Lord Chaitanya. And, and his son uh, will, will reply, there's no difference between Narayan and Krishna, which was kind of the right answer. Uh, we actually went to Sri Rangam and went to the house of Vienkata Bhatta. And in, in the courtyard with Krishna Kshetra Maharaj and 50 other people, we did a you know wonderful kirtan there. And you couldn't see there was in the courtyard was a little temple room with with the deities that you could not see. I mean, you needed a flashlight to see them. And when we saw them, there were deities of Lord Jagannath, but they had faces <laughs> like Gornitai. It was quite amazing experience. So this is, uh, uh, Biancata Bhatta was actually converted by Lord Chaitanya's kirtan and manifestation, you know, bodily manifestations. Um, there is a, a temple in Ranganat, in Sri Rangam, which is like a South Indian temple, you know, looks like every other temple. Uh, this, there's like thousands of them. Matter of fact, we went, we went on a bus and we drove hundreds of miles, you know, visited hundreds of temples. And, uh, yeah, unfortunately, the, the, the commander of this expedition was a, a brahmachari from Croatia that formerly was a soldier. So he, he kept us marching like soldiers. And we were all kind of middle, middle aged people. And there was only one younger couple with a five-year-old kid who after three days uh, actually said the most intelligent thing I've, I've heard in a long time. He said, ask his mother, how come we go to the same temple every day? <laughs> we drove hundreds of miles, hundreds of miles, so hundreds of temples, and it looked all the same. It was more or less emerged, you know, eventually mer everything merged into, into one thing. Um, so Gopal Bhatta, um, in 1511, uh, Lord Chaitanya stayed in the house of Yankata Bhatta and his son Gopal. He was only a child. Um, when the, the little boy offered his respects at the feet of Lord Chaitanya. The Lord picked him up and held him on his lap and affectionately embraced the boy. Um, he, uh, Lord Chaitanya used to actually give remnants of his own prasad to the boy. This is something he wouldn't do to anybody else, you know, because he was playing the role of his devotee. Krishna, you know, didn't wanna, didn't wanna do that, but he actually blessed Gopal Bhatta and he became an acharya. Um, so mostly it's, it's about uh, being cut about that. So let's see. Uh, the Lord spent four months of the rainy season at the home of Yankata, discussing many things about Krishna and his pastimes. After this, he bid farewell. Gopal Bhatta fainted at the Lord's lotus feet. The Lord 
comforted little Gopal, saying, Now you must serve at the home of your mother and father. Later you will come to Vrindavan. There you will constantly hear and glorify the holy name of Sri Krishna. This way, after instructing the whole family, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu went on his way. Within a short time, Gopal Bhatta Goswami learned Sanskrit grammar, poetry, rhetoric, and became expert in all the scriptures, beginning with the Vedanta Sutra. His uncle, he, he had a good stock family, he was Prabodhananda Saraswati. Um, and personally instructed him in different Bhakti Shastris. And he was, Gopal was always thinking, when can I have darshan again of the lotus feet of Lord Chaitanya? He was totally obsessed in a good way. So after uh, his parents' demise, Gopal Bhatta went to Vrindavan, always remembering the lotus feet of Mahaprabhu. When he arrived in Vrindavan, he found that Srila Rupa Goswami was preparing to send messages from, with some devotees from Vrindavan to Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and Puri. Sri Rupa and Sanatana Goswami already knew that Gopal Bhatta would be coming to Vrindavan. Rupa and Sanatana greeted him and treated him like a brother. From that time on, their lifelong friendship began. Um, Mahaprabhu heard from a courier that Gopal Bhatta had gone to Vrindavan. He was very happy to hear that. And he sent the messenger back to Rupa Goswami with his coping and outer garment to be given to uh, Gopal Bhatta as a symbols of renunciation. So he accepted the loincloth and the dress of a sannyasa. And this was the Lord's mercy and prasad. In this way, he, he will go and sp spend his nights in different kundas, and uh, his time was spent studying Shastra and writing. Uh, he, after some time, went to a um, pilgrimage to very holy, very holy places. Alt he halted in a town called Devavandiagram in Saharanpur near Harwar. There he was received with great delight by the residents. Um, one day he was on his way to the house of a devotee near the edge of town. The, there was a great storm in the afternoon and he took shelter of a Brahman in a house of a Brahman who was a great devotee of Lord Krishna. Uh, and he took care of the needs of Sri Bhatta Goswami with great care. And Sri Pad Gopal Bhatta Goswami was very happy. The Brahman had no son. Gopal Bhatta blessed him saying, may you have a son who is a great devotee of Krishna. The Brahman then said, I shall give you my first son to engage in the service of Krishna as you see fit. After spending some, spending some time in Harwar, he went for the north of Nepal to the Gandaki River where he retrieved 12 Shalagram Silas from the river. Um, he used to keep them in a cloth bag around his neck. Still, he had a desire to worship the Shiv Vigraha of the Lord in his deity form. Around this time, a rich merchant visited Sri Gopal Bhatta Goswami. Eager to serve, the rich man offered some fine clothes and ornaments for the service of the Lord. Gopal Bhatta placed these things before his shalagram, saying tearfully that he wished he could adorn the Lord with all the nice ornaments and clothes, but he had shalagram shila, so he couldn't. That night, Sri Bhatta Goswami offered Artik and Boga and put his shalagrams to rest, covering them carefully in a basket and hanging the basket on the branch of the tree under which he lived. Then after performing his bhajan, he took some prasad and went to sleep. The next morning, he bathed in the Yamuna as usual and went to wake his shalagrams. When he opened the basket, he saw in the midst of the shalagrams, one of the shalagram shilas had turned into a full-fledged deity of Krishna in a charming threefold bending posture who stood there looking exquisitely beautiful. Do you know this deity? Brother Raman. Uh, he was in an ocean of joy, shedding tears, offering full dandavas to the deity. He spontaneously offer hymns and prayers to the Lord. Hearing of this miracle, Sri Rupan Sanatan, as well as other Vaishnavas and Goswamis, quickly went and saw the world enchanting beauty of Aditi as tears of divine love flow from their eyes. In the year 1599, on the full moon of the Vaishaka day, the sweet Didi of Krishna became manifest. The Goswamis named the Didi Sri Radha Raman Deva. After Almost 10 years later, Sri Gopal Bhatta Goswami went to take his noon bath in the Yamuna and returned to his kuti to perform his bhajan. From a distance, he saw a young boy sitting at the door of his hut. When the boy saw 
Shibata Goswami, he arose and offered his obeisances at the Goswami's feet. Sri Gopal Bhatta asked him, who are you? The boy said, I'm from Devadan, Devavan Diagram in Saharanpur. I have come from there. Bhatta Goswami said, who's your father? Why have you come to me? The boy said, my father has sent me to engage in your service. My name is Gopinath. Gopal Bhatta then remembered the boy's father in Sharanpur, in which the Brahman said he would give the Goswami his son to engage in the service of the Lord. After this time, Sri Gopinath served Sri Bhatta Goswami with great attention. Subsequently, the boy became known as Sri Gopinath Purjari Goswami. He remained a Brahmachari and served the Radharaman Didi up, up in, until his death. Sri Gopal Bhatta Goswami served his beloved Didi lovingly, remembering the words and teachings of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Um, in this way, the eyes of Gopal Bhatta will often be filled with tears of divine love that flow like gushing streams. Where, uh, uh, upon Sri Radha Raman bestowed upon Sri Bhatta Goswami a divine vision of Sri Goranga himself. The Bhakti Ratna Kar forced Taranga said, when Sri Bhatta Goswami was overwhelmed by Krishna Prema, Sri Radha Raman revealed himself as Sri Goranga Deva. Sri Gopal Bhatta Goswami accepted Sri Nivasacharya as his disciple. Sri Dasanathan Goswami composed Hari Bhakti Vilas in collaboration with Gopal Bhatta Goswami, who edited the work. Sanatan Goswami had such great affection for Gopal Bhatta, he even published the book under his name. Sri Gopal Bhatta was responsible for originating the sixth thesis of Satsandarva, later elaborated, elaborately developed by Sri Jiva Goswami. Shiva Jiva Goswami writes in the beginning of his Tattva Sandarva, a devotee from South India who was born of a Brahman family and was a very intimate friend of Rupa Goswami and Sanatana Goswami, has written a book that he has not compiled systematically. Therefore, I, a tiny living entity called Jiva, am trying to assort the events of the book systematically, consulting the direction of great personalities like Madhva, Sridhar Swami, and Ramanujacharya. Gopal Bhatta Goswami had written a foreword to Jiva Goswami Satsandarva. He wrote a commentary on Krishna Karnamrita. He also wrote Sat Kriya Saradipika, a guide to Vaishnava samskaras and rituals for birth ceremonies, sacred thread initiations, marriage ceremonies, sannyas, and funerals. In addition to he composed many other scriptures. In the Goraganadesh Deepika, Sri Kavikarnapur Goswami writes Anangamanjari Sadhya Gopal Bhat Bhatka Bhat Goswami Nim Kochidahu Shri Guna Manjari. In my opinion, that person who in Vrindavan Lila was Ananga Manjari is now Gopal Bhatta Goswami. Some authorities, however, have given their opinion that he was Guna Manjari. So that is that is all for today. Anything else? All glories to Gopal Bhatta Goswami, all glories to Srila Prabhupada. Hare Krishna.